So this is kind of all the detailed, very heavily mathematical content that you need to be able to cover for the exam. And I'll just tell you, up to this is probably like 40% of the exam. Because at least one free form answer question has to involve this. So that's already like, so half of 33% or 15 some percent. And um, there will be some multiple choice questions that um, also match with this, or maybe a portion of a free form question. So this alone covers about 30 to, well, 30% 30 of the exam, uh, minimum. Then the other 30% or so that's still in quantum mechanics is out of chapter eight. This is where, um, um, so we, uh, this is where we stop doing detailed calculations because they become too hard. <laughs> um, we, we, so, you know, um, the hydrogen atom, for the full solution, it has to be described in three-dimensional um, um, three dimensional space, and we are not going to do that. Um, there is a way to turn a three-dimensional Schrodinger equation into one-dimensional version by introducing a different form of this, but I never mentioned it. I'm not going to you know, test you on it. One thing I can tell you is, so let me start the heading. Um, so this is now what falls under, so it's still under wave mechanics, but more of, let's just call it hydrogen atom. So in the hydrogen atom, let me start out with the most important things you ought to know. And the most important thing above everything else is not listed explicitly here. Well, when you read section 8.1, you will see that the, at the very beginning is where they talk about the quantum numbers. So really the atomic, um, the quantum numbers You've seen them. There are four of them. N, L, M sub L, and M sub S for the electron. Um, that's going to be the biggest thing, because this is how the solutions are characterized. And even though I won't ask you to come up with those solutions on your own, um, these describe their very basic properties. Because um, so this is kind of a switching point where we are no longer deriving things for ourselves. We are more referring to the work other people have done, and this is like the page numbers. This is how we refer to those solutions that someone else um, derived. Um, so the quantum numbers. This is the biggest starting point. And once you have these quantum numbers, then you can describe things like the ground state. The Oh, wait, I guess I should point out this one is a little bit special. This is the spin quantum number. So when you are dealing with a wave function, there is no actual wave function form for spin. You only have to deal with the orbital quantum numbers. So if you are looking at the hydrogen atom ground state, then you only get to specify these first three numbers. So dealing with the hydrogen atom, I could ask you to ask you to do some simple calculations involving some states of a hydrogen atom. It's probably going to be um, <laughs> ground state. <laughs> or it could involve excited states. So I could ask you something about like with n equals 2. But I can almost guarantee you that I will never ask you about wave function states that deal with some non-zero orbital angular momentum. Because that forces you to deal with the, the spherical harmonics. Um, and although I mentioned them, I, I'm not going to really require you to know spherical harmonics. But um, you may need, be able to do this type of calculations here, but using these wave functions. And I think you had some homework questions dealing with that, right? I assigned those. Yeah, but the homework contains a tutorial part, so we can know uh, what should we do to simplify the um, yeah, you prob I, I do think you do need to know this at least. So I think this is what um, Gauge is referring to, simplifying three-dimensional calculation into one-dimensional calculation. So this is the fully three-dimensional calculation. Let's say you are trying, well, well um, 
Yeah, so this is the fully three-dimensional calculation. Um, you, it involves triple integral of, uh, with respect to, let's say, dx, dy, dz, the three three-dimensional parameters. And whatever, let's say you are calculating on expectation value. Then the expectation value of Q is going to be calculated this way. Integral of this quantity, the wave function, Q acting on that wave function, and then wave function, complex conjugate. And these wave functions are functions of x, y, and z. Right? This is the kind of most general expression for um, the type of calculation you would do to calculate this expectation value, like the average distance from the, uh, I think that's what your homework question was. So the very first simplification is that for hydrogen atom, you are dealing with a spherically symmetric situation. So you don't really want to use Cartesian coordinate, you want to use a spherical coordinate. And this is where I become a little bit ambivalent because um, it's something you ought to know. Because Math 3C is a prerequisite for this class. So this is something you ought to have seen, that when you have integral with respect to these three parameters, this can turn into integral with respect to theta, phi, and r in terms of these. Um, so it's easiest if you think of this as the volume element of dv. And in um, multivariable calculus, you ought to have learned that the volume element for the spherical coordinate system is dr times, um, I'm using my notation where our theta is mathematician's phi. So r d theta times r sine theta d phi, right? That looks familiar with the role of phi and theta interchange. Yeah. The, what this is, this, these are three orthogonal directions. That's how you get the volume element. Uh, the displacement along r direction, displacement along like tangential to change of theta, displacement along um, tangential to change of phi. Um, so with that, this integral turns into uh, still triple integral, but in terms of I have r squared. Um, so r squared, I have sine theta, sine theta, um, and then I have dr d theta d phi. dr d theta d phi. And before, the parameter go, used to go from negative infinity to positive infinity. But these parameters are no longer infinitely ranged parameters. Phi, the angle along the xy plane, only goes one full circle, 0 to 2 pi. So phi goes from 0 to 2 pi. Theta, it um, only goes from 0 straight up to straight down, 0 to pi. So theta only goes from 0 to pi. And r, radius, it only goes from 0 okay, to infinity. So r goes from 0 to infinity. Um, so that's what this is from this. The rest actually remains the same. The rest portion here, that just remains the same as the wave function complex conjugate in terms of vector r, the operator, um, and then the wave function again. Um, so this portion actually remains the same. And um, so the, I think the tutorial I gave you actually walked through this. And this is what your textbook gives you. Your textbook gives you the simplified version of this for the next step. Um, this is valid when your operator or the wave function does not depend on the angles. That's kind of why I'm telling you that I will always give angular momentum zero quantities for detailed calculation, because I, I don't think it's reasonable for me to expect, do the triple integral. <laughs> like, I, I don't think that's reasonable. So I'm only going to give, I am always going to give you the situation where all these quantities, they only ever depend on r. They don't depend on theta or phi. So that's where now it can become one dimensional instead of three dimensional. And this is where you have to be careful. That doesn't mean you can just get rid of these. You still have to do the theta integral. You still have to do the phi integral. 
And when you do that, you get 4 pi. How many here are familiar with the term star radiance or solid angle? Yeah. The full solid angle of anything is 4 pi. It's kind of coming from here. It's uh, the 4 pi r squared without the r squared. Yeah. So, so you should know this. Uh, you should know what your textbook gives you. Your textbook gives, as a simplified version of this, after you've completed these angular integrals, uh, somewhere here, then what you have is um, integral with respect to radius from 0 to infinity. And all this integrand here becomes 4 pi r squared. And th that particular expression is uh, meaningful because you can think of, uh, well, you can think of 4 pi r squared times dr. You can think of this as the volume element, where you are talking about the volume of the spherical shell, area times the thickness of the shell. Yeah. So um, I guess if you just want to skip to this and do the calculation starting from here, that's fine. And I may give you a calculation that involves something like this. Because as long as you have understood um, how you came to here, then starting from here, the rest is one dimensional calculation. So yeah, that would, uh, that's a good question. So that would be uh, something that you may be expected to do. And it's especially a good question because when you look at my sample exam, the one exam that I've given for this class, you won't see that kind of calculation. And I've been rethinking about it. I may be giving that. As with the last time, I haven't written the exam yet. I don't know what I'll write. But this is one of the possibilities I'm thinking of. That's why I gave you that homework question in the tutorial form in the first place, so that I can give you that homework uh, exam question if I wanted to. Okay. All right, uh, hydrogen atom. So quantum numbers are super important. Simple calculations involving these. Then uh, the rest become very much um, uh, very much qualitative. So I guess I can kind of list the topics of the qualitative things that you are supposed to know. So those qualitative, how long have I? Hmm? Mm. I have been speaking for less than 50 minutes, right? This says 237. All right. I don't know why it feels like I've been speaking longer, but. <laughs> so. Um, the other qualitative things you should know are, they're kind of all here. You might remember from here, it's a, you know, this was dealing with the Zeeman effect, splitting of energy levels with application of magnetic field. I'm not going to ask you to calculate the magnetic dipole moment of electron. In fact, because we didn't spend any time on it. But I think essentially I can ask you something about Zeeman effect at a very qualitative level. And Essentially, to the effect, well, to the, um, that this Zeeman effect is tied to this quantum number. That's what you have seen in your homework, and that's what I can kind of expect to, you to remember. Um, so there's obviously the electron spin. That's something you should know about, that electron has a half spin, and what that means for um, different uh, states that an atom can have especially in connection to the Pauli exclusion principle. So you should know Pauli exclusion principle. Uh, one thing I will never test you on, even while assuming you have some underlying understanding of it, is the periodic table. Uh, I would never test you on electron configuration. Um, I would never expect you to know where the elements are, other than where the hydrogen and helium are, because um, that's kind of all I remember. Well, I know where lithium is, and I think it kind of stops there. Is it potassium right below lithium, or is it sodium right below lithium? Lithium and then potassium, right? And then sodium. OK, so I have a rule. Whatever I can't do, I don't ask you to do. So if I can barely remember. Uh, up to lithium, and then after that, my memory starts to fade out. Is it boron? No, it's not boron. Hydrogen, helium, lithium. Sodium, hydrogen, uh, lithium, sodium, beryllium. Beryllium, BE, right? Beryllium. Yeah, okay, lithium, beryllium, okay. Yeah, yeah. So 
I don't memorize the element, uh, periodic table of elements. I don't expect you to. This will actually be important when you get to nuclear physics um, with the nuclear reactions. I do want you to know about nuclear reactions and radioactive decays. But um, I will give you the, what the relevant section of periodic table is. Um, if you don't remember what element you get, if you go from uranium and lose two protons, then uh, you will have something to refer to. All I expect you to know is, um, you know, do you move two spaces or one space? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, but so you should know power exclusion principle, which is very important together with the spin, explaining the structure of the periodic table. But this is a physics class, not a chemistry class. So that you don't actually have to remember what those elements are. Uh, you do, at, a, at most, you should know that on the first row, there's two elements because of two spins. On the second row, there are eight elements because of all the different values these can take. And the most I would go is the third row because starting with the fourth row, you start having to take into account <laughs> chemistry and I don't want to do that. <laughs> Uh, let's see, and I think I mentioned this that um, you, we didn't cover the, or we didn't cover x-rays, so you won't be tested on that. Lasers, I think the most we covered this, we covered what the acronym laser stands for. Um, so that's at the level at which I would expect you to know. I think the post sample exam has something about inver population inversion and whatnot, and um, I'm very hesitant to test you on lasers, let's just leave it there. So at most, there's probably going to be one or two uh, multiple choice questions on laser, possibly at the level of, do you know what the acronym laser came from? <laughs> and you can study more on your own if you are interested in it. Um, I think that's everything, more or less everything in chapter eight. Did I forget anything big? Oh, angular momentum. Um, I, I think that's worth expanding out. <laughs> so, um, so um, these two quantum numbers, so it kind of falls under quantum numbers. And these two quantum numbers deal with the orbital angular momentum. And you should know enough about them. So you should remember enough about orbital angular momentum. Not in the sense of doing any complicated calculation, because as I said, you can't really, but in the sense of the physical meaning of these quantum numbers. So for example, um, so I guess at the very basic level, given the L value, you should know what uh, values of the projection are allowed, right? If L is equal to one, then the projections are allowed are plus one, zero, minus one. And in fact, the, uh, taking it back a little bit, given the n value, you should know what allowed values of L are. If n is equal to 1, then the only allowed value of L is actually 0. If uh, n is equal to 2, then L equals 1 is allowed, and so on. So um, those are more basic relationships between quantum numbers, a result that somebody else derived, and you are told, and you are just expect to have it memorized for the exam. And one more thing I expect you to have memorized is how these uh, uh, essentially integer numbers correspond to actual physically measurable parameter. So the projection is the easier one because projection relates directly to the projection of the angular momentum you can measure. So G projection, you can just pick any axis, G is the common one, who knows why. Uh, so G projection of angular momentum is equal to the angular, the magnetic quantum number times h bar. So that's one. And the other formula is the one that you probably should have in your formula sheet in case I ask. The, um, the magnitude of the angular momentum, let me label it as L squared, or that this would be like the angular momentum vector that product with itself. That's what this is. The magnitude is given by, so there's h bar squared. That's just giving you correct units. And um, now the second part is one that you probably should have written down somewhere. The angular momentum quantum number times the number plus one. And I don't think we ever 
discussed why this is the case, other than showing you some kind of basic picture of the model of the spin kind of spinning around the axis. It's not really the correct model, but whatever. But the thing that's important for you to know is that the maximum possible value of this is actually greater than the maximum possible value of this. So um, that's one of the strangest things about quantum mechanical angular momentum. And that's something that you should know at a qualitative at this level. And you had the homework questions on those, I think yeah, I remember. About polar angles, do you explain yeah. Yeah. If I, I would describe those angles if I ever ask you about those. Because that polar angle that it's describing, it's very specific to a model that your textbook uses. So let me just show you what that model is that I'm talking about. That polar angle is very specific to this model here. Um, yeah. Wait, was it under still hydrogen atom? Yeah, the, the, yeah, so the polar angle, it's a very specific, I guess you could kind of express it this way, but it's not really the case that angular momentum points in this direction. To make more physical sense of it, this is the model that they are imagining. But even that isn't quite right. So if I were to ask you for this uh, polar angle here, then I would uh, first describe the picture because I'm asking you something model specific. So, um, and the model is not what I'm testing you on. I'm testing you on this. So whatever picture I'm using to test you on this is some, a picture that I would need to give you. Good. Does that kind of explain? Yes? Yeah, as far as the angular momentum goes, the, what is actually exact is what you did in lab. What you did with the spin off angular momentum, that's the exact calculation. That's the representation that has no error in it. And um, the thing is, I can't test you on any of those either. <laughs> so, so I just want to, for the purpose of this class, I want to leave you at just uh, with the realization that quantum mechanical angular momentum is a very interesting quantity that there is no way to simplify down to some classically understandable picture. You can use a classical model if you want, but what you do in using classical model is you trade away some correctness. So uh, there are, I don't remember exactly what you can do. I think it comes in like addition of angular momenta. If you take this uh, spinning angular momentum model too far, you are going to run into some difficulty, something that's wrong. So, it, so the only thing that's known to be correct to, as you know, to, under this kind of stress test, is the calculation you did in lab. Um, so, but I'm not testing you on that. Yeah. Um, so I guess that covers chapter eight. Um, orbital angular momentum. Yeah, I think, so let me just give you this warning. Section 8.1 covers a lot. <laughs> so to go through it in detail, don't skip this section. Uh, almost the rest of them you can kind of skim through, but section 8.1 is something that you want to know in detail because that covers a lot. <laughs> I, I think they really should have split it into more sections, but this covers a lot, read it through carefully. Um, all right, so that's the quantum mechanics portion of the exam. Uh, up through here should cover like 60, 70% of your exam. Um, 